This was brought to my attention a few days ago. Does anybody remember the 2018 head coaching cycle? How many marquee jobs were made available? How many prominent names decided to hitch their wagon to a new program? And the way that we viewed those hires. Hindsight's 2020, and five years later, now you look at the 21 names that were brought in in the offseason. One remains with their university, and it's not a power four job. It's actually Mike Bloomgram at Rice. So I figured it's the college football offseason. Let's go ahead and discuss why the 2018 head coaching cycle is a learning lesson for determining how programs are going to be built moving forward. But before we begin, if you're new to the channel, welcome on in, people. Make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. We talk college football daily over here. Recap in 2023, a look ahead to 2024, a bunch of other nonsense. So if this is the daily dose you need to survive the offseason, might I recommend that you hit the subscribe button, leave a comment telling me, which hire was absolutely the worst of all hires that could have ever been made? Tell your friends, your family, your mortal enemies, best of bros, the drunk dude passed out in a public's parking lot, college football aficionados everywhere about this channel because we're on the race to become the number one YouTube show talking college football daily. Continue to follow me on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson, Twitter, X, Instagram, slide in the DMs. I love answering questions and turning them into videos, but that way conversations surrounding our favorite sport never have to stop flowing. 21 names were hired in the offseason, 11 at Power 5 jobs. None of them panned out. None of them panned out. It's, it's baffling how big of a miss 2018 was. Like you go back and you look at certain draft classes in the NFL and you remember how talented this player was at the collegiate level. Oh, they're going to transition to the NFL with these. They're going to become the next big time wide receiver, playmaker, pass rusher, quarterback. And three years down the line, they end up being nothing more than just a scrub on the bench or a depth piece. That's the same way that you view these coaches' hires. Go back and just look at some of the names. Kevin Sumlin leaves Texas A&M, takes over for Arizona. Uh, he goes 9-20, and 20, has one of the worst seasons before he's finally fired. Herm Edwards gets the job at Arizona State, 26-20. and 20, But during that stretch, so many litigations against the NCAA, so many violations. It ultimately led to the firing of him and a multitude of players that ended up having successful careers play elsewhere. You had Chad Morris at, at Arkansas. Good God. Uh, I mean, this has got to be one of the worst hires in college football history. Four and 18 out after two years, never won a conference game. Dan Mullen, I guarantee you Scott Strickland misses him right now. He went 34 and 15 because he didn't like recruiting and he was shown the door after taking his team to two New Year's six bowl appearances. Willie Taggart leaves Oregon after one year, goes nine and 12 in Tallahassee, ultimately opening the door for greener pastures underneath the guy in Mike Norvell. Scott Frost, can't miss guy. Nebraska missed. They missed big time, 16 and 31. Matt Luke, 15 and 21, took over as the interim coach in place of Hugh Freeze, ends up leading to get Lane Kiffin because you have one of the biggest plays in Egg Bowl history, Elijah Moore. I think everyone in Oxford thanks you for now bringing in Kiffin, who has changed the program for the better. Mario Cristobal goes 35 and 13, leaves in the middle of the night for a program that he loves to the core of his heart. Jeremy Pruitt, 16 and 19. Jimbo Fisher, Last six years, gets a plaque at the start of his tenure. National champions, 2,000 insert here. 40 and 25, never gets to 10 wins in College Station. And now Chip Kelly, a program that has always been mediocre to maybe average at best in UCLA, leaves on his own terms technically to become the offensive coordinator for Ohio State. Every one of these hires was supposed to be a slam dunk move. Jimbo Fisher. That has got to be one of the biggest blunders in all of college football. Has his team at a national championship and four years later decides to depart Tallahassee to go to the SEC. They give him a plaque. They give him a monumental contract. 10 years, $75 million for him to never get past nine wins. Yeah, you had the one really good year against 2020 when it was an all SEC schedule. And you probably could have gotten 10 wins if your one game against Ole Miss wasn't canceled. But still... Never got to 10 wins. You saw more regression underneath Kevin Sumlin when Rich Rodriguez left than you ever saw progression. What happened in Tempe, Arizona, ultimately led to a disaster of a situation for a guy in Kenny Dillingham moving forward. You look moving forward for a team like UCLA. I don't know if they're going to get any better now in the Big Ten. Scott Frost, baffling. This was the most safe hire that I think everybody projected on. And then he ends up losing 31 games. I think 29 of them were by one possession, just could never close the gap. Dan Mullen, Dan Mullen hates recruiting in the SEC. That's not going to cut it. 
production wise, he was phenomenal, but you realize when it comes to recruiting, that's the bread and backbone of every conference. So there was not a single hire that worked besides Cristobal. And the only reason why Cristobal left Eugene was because if he wanted to return closer to home, he wanted to be near his family. And it was very hard to argue that up in, up in Oregon. It was very hard for even Phil Knight to hand out Nike money to keep him around. It ended up being probably the biggest blessing because Dan Lanning has this team humming and looking like a Big Ten contender. But again, hindsight's 2020. They wanted Cristobal. He did a lot of good work, even though they never saw the end goals and the fruits of their labor. This leads to the conversation of why it's important to temper your expectations moving forward. It's why this past offseason, I only graded two hires as a plus. One was Willie Tag. I mean, one was Willie Fritz at Houston. And the reason I believe that is because even if he's only there for five years, it's going to set a foundation, a foundation that has been set at every other university. And Jonathan Smith at Oregon, I mean, at Michigan State, he needed a new, a new job. They needed a new direction. They need a coach who could get the best version of quarterback play. Those were the only A plus hires that you can make. And even then, there still is a risk when it comes to moving forward in the future of college football. But one of the biggest problems that we have moving in this sport is people aren't willing to stay patient. They aren't willing to see more progress for coaches out there. Now, for some programs, that really didn't help. Willie Taggart going to Tallahassee, that was a move made based off of a ramification move of Jimbo Fisher leaving for College Station. But you realize that there were flaws with Willie Taggart when he was at Oregon. There was flaws with Willie Taggart when he was at South Florida. But You just look past it because you said Florida guy understands the area, lay of the land, good at recruiting. We know that he is going to be in a lot of prominence of the program. Oh, and that's all you hear. And then guess what? It ends up being a nine and 12 finish. Guy can never get over 500. It's a bad hire. It's a move that couldn't be made. Scott Frost. Scott Frost was supposed to be safe, secure. Everybody knew everything about him, but you live past a few of the minor details. Outside of really that one year at UCF, did you ever feel like he overexceeded expectations? Even as the offense coordinator at Oregon, did you ever feel like he overexceeded expectations? Not in my opinion. Kevin Sumlin was fired for a reason. Oh, hired a prominent Power 5 head coach at the time. Let's just bring him on over to Tucson. What worked in the SEC is going to work there. Did you ever think that maybe he was the problem with Texas A&M? Did you ever think that maybe he was the issues that were going on that led to Six and six finishes, seven and five records, not meeting the expectations found at College Station. No, you didn't really care. You just said, oh, guy's proven name, guy's won everywhere. Let's go ahead and bring him on in. Sometimes you run through the hires and you don't look at the entire picture because if you're just trying to get a prominent name. And that's a learning curve. Every single one of these coaches this offseason may end up panning out. There's a guy by the name of Tom Fornelli. Most of you probably heard of him. He goes, he works for SC, uh, CBS Sports. He says every single off season, good hire. Don't ever will pan out. That's the way you have to look at it because you don't know what's going to happen. Chip Kelly going and leading an offense at UCLA in Westwood with what could have been a great destination ends up in his final game being booed by fans. And the fan base is freaking tired of him to where they actually were very excited when they bring in Deshaun, uh, when they bring in Deshaun Foster as the new head coach. They were actually content with Chip Kelly leaving because he didn't buy into the program. Dan Mullen didn't buy into recruiting. Good coach. But if you didn't realize that at a place like Florida, recruiting was going to be such a major factor, you never should have made the hire to begin with. That's just the way it goes about it. Because Mississippi State, you recruited at a top 45 level. Starkville is going to be sound with that. Florida, top 20, that's not going to cut it. Top 10 is barely going to cut it. You're looking for top seven results in Gainesville. So it's just a learning lesson. Some of these hires are going to pan out this year. Willie Fritz could. John Summerall could. I think Jonathan Smith could. I love the addition of Mike Elko in College Station. I think that there are enough moves made this year to where we'll be talking about some of these teams as contenders moving forward. And they're going to have some hires that end up backfiring. Maybe it's Brent Brennan at Arizona. Maybe it's Jed Fish at Washington. Maybe it's Gerard Parker at Troy. Who knows? What I can tell you is that now looking back at 2018, This is a reason to temper your expectations. You have no idea what you're going to get from a head coach. What worked for one program maybe doesn't work for your program. All these names were supposed to be staples, studs, fixtures of college football moving forward. One coach is still employed by the same university. One coach could have been employed by their university, but in a sense, 
I think Eugene, Oregon is very content with Mario running the show now down in Coral Gables because they got Dan Lanning in the process. Leave a comment down below. Who did you think was the worst hire of 2018? Which names are going to be prominent moving forward and which ones are you a little bit cautious on going into 2024? Another major offseason filled with hires at different locations. Tell your friends, your family, your mortal enemies, best of bros about this channel. We're on the race to become the number one YouTube show talking college football daily. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, the ring notification. That way you don't miss a single episode. I'm Cole Thompson. We'll see you next time, folks.